Well, good morning and welcome to the program today. <coughs> we just appreciate you uh, joining us and are delighted that we can spend this time with you today and delighted that we can bring you the truth. You know, there's a lot that is being spoken in this hour. There's a lot of uh, politics going on and people telling things that they want us to believe are, are the truth. And a lot of things we'd like to believe is the truth. But, you know, in man's greatest in, intention, a lot of times he can't produce what he promises. But, you know, the Word of God is full of truth. He is full of promises. His promises are yes and amen. And he can perform what he speaks. Matter of fact, the Word says he watches over his Word to perform it. He watches over it to make sure it does accomplish what he wants it to. And he doesn't just speak it and leave it to chance. He's not a God of chance. He's a God of intent, intentional purpose. And you know, he does things on purpose. Uh, you and I are, are created on purpose. We were intended from the, in the heart of God to come forth and to, to be his people and to live for him and to share this truth with others. You know, <clears throat> I remember a, a lady that I, I know her still, but once upon a time we were real, real close friends, and her testimony is very powerful. And uh, I would like to get her to come and share that with you one day if I could talk her into it. But <laughs> she always tells about what God did for her. But the saddest part of her testimony to me it's the part where she says, you know, when I was in sin, not one person told me Jesus Christ loved me. Just think about that, that not one person told her that Jesus loved her. I'm sure a lot of people told her how bad she was and, and what a mess her life was in and how she needed to quit doing the things that she was doing. And they had good intention. And they wanted her to straighten up and do right. But not one person told her Jesus loved her. So that's what I want to tell you this morning. I don't care where you are, what you found yourself doing this morning, where you find yourself waking up or going to bed, whatever you're doing right this moment, I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you. He loved you enough to leave the, the, the greatest glories of heaven to come to this earth and become a human being and to live a sinless life and to die and raise again for you, had you been the only person to ever be born upon this planet, he would have done that just for you. And so I don't want you to ever know, have that uh, opportunity to say, nobody told me Jesus loved me, because I'm telling you right now, he loves you unconditionally. You say, I've done too much, I've pushed him away. You know what? You can't push him so far that he won't love you anyway. And so this morning, we just want to instill that into your heart that Jesus Christ loves you. And you know John 3.16 is a scripture that people say, oh, there you go, quoting John 3.16. But you know what? That is the, the scripture that divided history. That is the scripture that history hinges on. That part where God so loved the world that he gave. You know, not a lot of people give. We, we take. But God, he gives. And he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, you are a whoever today, and if you will just receive Him and believe in Him, then you won't have to perish, but you can have this eternal life. And I'm so grateful <clears throat> for that this morning, so grateful to know that I am a whosoever, and that I've come to Him, and He has washed me clean, and He has made me His, and Gives me reason to get up in the morning. Gives me reason to go about my day to know that Jesus Christ loves me. <clears throat> Excuse me this morning. I'm delighted to have with me my guest today, Miss Deborah DeFee. Deborah's been with us before, and she has shared her testimony with us before. And if you want to uh, to go and find out uh, what she had to share that day, you can find her on our YouTube program by searching for Defining Moments with Evangelist Lynn Taylor. And you can find her testimony there. And God's done a great work in Deborah's life. And it's all because of this scripture right here. Because God loved her so much. So I'm just going to welcome her around to the mic today. 
And Deborah, welcome to the Finding Moments. And just come and allow the Lord and the Holy Spirit to use you however he desires. Thank you, Miss Lynn. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be back today. Um, Any time that I get to share what God has done for me, um, it's just an honor and a pleasure. Um, I did give my testimony earlier, and you, like Miss Lynn said, you can find it. I'm going to hit some spots in my testimony today, but I want to get into the part where God went to work in me. Um, from a very young age, I was uh, had some sexual um, stuff that happened to me, some molestation from an uncle, and um, it kept me quiet for years by telling me that if I told what was going on, that he would, that something would happen to somebody I loved. So he kept me quiet several years. But when I was eight years old, I had finally come to the point to where I couldn't take it anymore. And uh, I had decided that during the um, Thanksgiving holidays that I was going to tell my mother about it. Uh, and on Saturday morning, she always went to the beauty shop, and I went with her. So on the way home, I was going to tell her this, this news. Um, but... That morning at the speedy shop, she uh, she got up and she went into the restroom and she uh, fainted, hit her head, and it killed her. She had an aneurysm. Um, so at eight years old, uh, I felt like I had, I had killed my mother because I was going to tell this secret. Um, I had been raised in church uh, all my life. I knew about God. I knew, you know, the, the, that you were supposed to go to church, you know. Uh, but I shook my fist at God that day and told him that I was through with him, that uh, I no longer wanted anything to do with him. But being eight years old, I was still uh, carried to church the rest of my time at home. Uh, but just as soon as I had a chance to leave home, and I did at 16 years old, uh, I quit school, I got married, uh, thought I knew it all, thought I knew what was best for me, and nobody could tell me nothing. Um but it was because of things that was that was happening at home that I couldn't I couldn't handle. So I got married. Um, it started a almost eleven year um, battle for me, from uh, emotional to verbal to physical abuse uh, in my marriage. Um, and the day my mother died, something died within me, and any time any anything that could have been in me to take care of me, to worry about what happened to me, uh, might have changed this, but there was nothing in me. Um, in fact, when I was nine years old, I decided I couldn't take it anymore, and I didn't want to live either. And uh, <clears throat> I tried to uh, kill myself by drinking uh, some of everything that was in the uh, closet in the bathroom, um, detergent, uh, anything that had a red cross on it, you know, that do not ingest, I did. I poured everything into a glass and tried to drink it. Well, it didn't make me, it didn't kill me, but it made me real sick. I never told anybody what happened that night, that I had tried that. After being sick and, and, and throwing up, I guess what, it went in my stomach. I went to bed, woke up during the night, and found myself in the closet with a extremely white being that was sitting in front of me holding my hands. And all I remember them saying was that it's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of you. I thought it was my mother. And I, I grew up the rest of my life believing that that was my mother telling me it was going to be okay. Um, like I said, at 16, I ran off, got married, and um, went through this for the next 10 years. Uh, five years into the marriage, I had my daughter. And um, besides accepting Jesus Christ into my heart, that's, that's the most meaningful thing that, to me, is my child. Um, but we stayed in it five more years. Anyway, we got a divorce, I got a divorce and uh, moved to another town. And uh, got a whole new set of friends. Got a whole new set of things that I did. Um, started uh, all I had been a allowed to do up to that point was drink. But um, started working a night job and and. and coming to work and finding out what everybody did all day long when I was at home sleeping you know I began to ask what do you what are you doing to be able to stay up all night and they introduced me to speed um nobody forced me to do it I wanted to do it because I just wanted to fit in um I can remember saying uh for the first time in my life I don't have somebody over me I went straight from my dad 
into a marriage, and there was always somebody over me. So at 26 years old, I kept claiming that I was 16 again, and I was going to live up the world. And um, so what anybody and everybody was doing, I thought I had to do it, or needed to do it to fit in. Um, this this rocked on for three or four, four or five years, and uh, just tried one drug after another. Uh, and then I was at a local bar one night, and um, a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to go outside and smoke a joint, and I told him, yeah. On our way out the door, a guy approached him, and they went off to the side. And he, he came back, we went on to the car, and we you know, smoked our joint, went on back inside. And two weeks later, I found out that the county that I lived in had a, um, a warrant for my arrest. It was a warrant for distribution of cocaine. The guy had sold uh, cocaine to an undercover agent, and both of them said that I'm the one that sold it to him. I uh, went to court, and uh, long story short, ended up with a five-year sentence. December the 1st, 1989, I walked into the doors of Julia Tutwiler Prison. Um, just scared out of my mind because I'd never been in anything like that. Um, part of my family is in, in law enforcement, and for a long time I wanted to be a part of it. But I found myself sitting in a bed when how I got there. And I was so angry that I was put in prison for something that I didn't do. It took me about two weeks to realize one day that God laid this in my heart. You may not have actually done what you're in prison for, but there's so many times that you could have been. Maybe one night you're innocent, but so many times it could have been me at, at any other time. I'm the one that put myself in that bar. I'm the one that put myself in that situation. I'm the one that put myself out there to be around drugs and alcohol and bars. So, yeah, I was guilty. Um, in there, I began to get an AA and NA, which was, was part of my sentencing to, to go through programs. And... Uh, Got into that, just went, you know, full force with it, uh, I, you know, as far as I could go with it. Uh, I stayed 11 months, and then I was released. And when I was released, I continued to stay in AA and NA. Uh, the only problem that I th thought I had at that particular time was every time I tried to be around a guy, I just got sick, and I couldn't understand why. And uh, some friends that I had had while I was in prison uh, they kept telling me, even when I was in there, they kept telling me that the reason I, I didn't want to be with a man was because I was gay. So by the time I got out and, and, and couldn't be with a guy, that's all I kept thinking, that's what's wrong with me. But I knew something was wrong with it because I'd been raised in church, and I had heard it all my life. Um, I went to counseling, uh, taught with people that I knew, and, and every which way I turned, you know, I was I was told, well, well how could something so ba bad you know something so good be against God doesn't God love you doesn't God want you to be happy um, so I kept doing this for about six to eight months that I finally decided one day maybe I am so for the next 17 years while I was in going to these uh, AA and NA um, I, I lived a gay lifestyle and and called myself happy uh, happy that I had ever been but not, not as happy as I was going to be. Um, <clears throat> after about 17 years of, of living this lifestyle, I went to bed one night, and uh, I had a vision. And in that vision, it was uh, I heard this sound. I heard this trumpet blow. And being raised in church, I knew what that trumpet was. It was a trumpet that blows when Jesus comes back. And in that vision, I was going down the road in my vehicle, and it was just as plain as it is sitting here today looking at this, these instruments. And I said, you know, my first thought was, that, that's the trumpet. Jesus is coming back. But as soon as I thought that, my next thought was, but you're not going. And I could see people rise before me. And I was still in my truck, and I couldn't figure out why. And I, I pulled over the side of the road, and I was just beating the steering wheel, and I was just begging God to give me another chance, just begging God, telling him I thought I was where I needed to be with you. I thought I was right with you. 
And I woke up beating my knees, asking God for another chance. And when I fully awoke, I told, hit my knees and I told him that every breath that I breathed from that day till the day I either go to him or he comes after me would be his. And I know that I have failed at that at times, but along with having God in my life, I have someone I can go to now. When I fall short of him, his will, all I've got to do is hit my knees and ask him for forgiveness. Now, I can't do that if I, if I do it and then say, well, I'll just do this, and then when I get through, I'll hit my knees. It don't work that way. It's got to be with a sense of heart. It's got to be with the expectation of turning from that. So I can't just use it to go have fun and then come back and, as the world looks at it, fun, and then come back to God when I get through. It don't work that way. you got to be sincere. you got to be 100% sold out to God. I could not do this life if I was living for the world during the week and living for God on the weekend. It don't work that way. The Bible tells us that God is a jealous God. He doesn't want no one before him. So I have to make sure that every part of my life is his. I sold out 100% to him that morning on my knees. And I'm not going to tell you that everything between then and now, that's been nine years ago, everything has been great and wonderful. Because life is life. And it doesn't matter if I'm saved or if I'm lost. Things are going to happen. But there's one thing about it. Today, when life happens, i got one to go to. That's going to take care of my heart. He's going to take care of my soul. And I know that when I leave this earth, I know where I'm going to be for eternity. You know, I hear people talk all the time about Christians this and Christians that, and I don't want to go to church because I don't want to be around hypocrites. Well, you know, if that's the only excuse that you think you're going to have when you meet God, it's not going to turn out too good because he gave his son for us. And I truly believe in my heart that what the first thing he's going to ask me is what I did with what he gave me. Did I reject it? Or did I let him come into my life and into my soul? And did I let him be my life? You know, Paul tells us in the Word that we have to die daily to ourselves. And we only live because Jesus lives through us. No matter what I do, it's gotta, i got to let him be in control. I have to get up every morning and hit my knees and ask God to, to direct my steps that day. To show me the path that he wants me to go today. You know, I have to ask him to help me empty me so that I can be filled with him and his spirit. You know, when Jesus ascended into heaven, um, he told the disciples that he would send another to comfort them. At that time, being part man, Jesus couldn't be everywhere. But if he ascended so that he could sit at the right hand of the Father... They could send the Holy Spirit to be with us, each and every one of us, at every moment of our life. The Holy Spirit can be in us if we accept him. But if our bodies is going to be the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, it's got to be worthy. Because he won't stay in junk. He won't stay in sin. He won't stay where the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity of God. And God cannot be around sin, so neither can the Holy Spirit. Um, if anything I have said today has touched anybody, whether it's the fact that you've been hurt as a child, whether you have done things, been raised one way or lived the other way, uh, whether you've been in jail, whether you've been in prison, uh, whether you've been wronged, whether you've lived a gay lifestyle, anything that's causing you the pain that you're living in today, let me be, please listen to the next things I say. Because when I give my life to God that morning, I gave my life to him. And that means anywhere that I can tell somebody about him and about his son, Jesus Christ, you know, I can't wait to do it. It's just, it's just so humbling and so, so, so powerful to me to be able to tell somebody else about God, whether it's on this radio station or somebody I meet in Walmart or somebody across the gas pump pumping gas. You know, I've always got to have God showing through me. i got to have Jesus Christ coming through whatever I say and whatever I do. You, you, you can talk the talk, but if you don't walk the walk, 
you're sending a message to people out there that, oh, look at that Christian. They say this, but they're doing that. You know, and, and, and people say, well, I, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to go to church. You know, the Bible says that we need to, for us not to forsake being with other people that are like him. So I have, for me, I have to be a part of a church. Now, I go to a lot of churches on, from time to time, uh, several sister churches, you know, I'll go for this or for that. But I've got to have a home church that I'm at every Sunday morning, that I'm on Wednesday night, on Sunday night, if, if I don't have something else that I need to go to. I've got to be a part of a family that God has put me in. I, and there's no doubt in my mind that God has sent me to the church I'm in. You know, and, and I see people leave churches because their feelings get hurt. Well, if I go to church because I'm watching and, and hearing what other people say, and I'm there for the wrong reason. Mm-hmm. I, they're, they're, I'm supposed to be there to glorify God and to teach other women that's coming in that church about God. And w- like I tell everybody all the time, my pet peeve is for a woman to come into a church, give her life to God, and then not be discipled because Satan is sitting right out the door waiting for her to come back out that door. Mm-hmm. And he, he has a powerful mind game that he plays, you know, that he, he, he works on our emotions. And um, you know, uh, several times over my night, last nine years, I've been told that God, God don't want me this bad as I've been. God don't want me for the things I've done. Um, and, you know, you did this. It says in the Bible, don't do that. Yeah, I did. And, yeah, it does. But today I have asked God to forgive me, and he has forgiven me and forgot it. I know that my biggest thing is me not forgiving. And I have learned and, and come to the conclusion that if I don't forgive myself, then I'm not trusting God to forgive me. So that's something I've had to work on. But the Bible says that once we for, ask for forgiveness, that God, he's, you know, for, he forgives and sends us as far as it is from the east to the west. So please listen to what I'm fixing to say, the most important when you, the God says, the God's word says in John fourteen six that the only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. So if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I don't care if you go to church 15 times a week. I don't care what you do. I don't care what your role is. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, a personal one-on-one relationship, then please check your, your, your walk with God. Second, if you decide that, okay, maybe I do want to be a Christian, what do I do? Romans 9, 10, 9 and 10 says that we speak with our mouths that God is, you know, the Father. He raised his son from the dead after three days. You know, and if we, if we glorify him and say that and start walking that walk and believe in him, and then in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21, it tells me that I'm an amb- I am an ambassador of Christ, which means everything I do, people look at it and see if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing for Christ. Mm-hmm. When ambassadors from the United States go to different countries, they're being watched. And it won't take much for that to put, give the United States a black eye as far as what they stand for and what they are about and that's the same way I am I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ God's son and everything I do every step I make every action I take people of the world are out there watching and last 2 Corinthians 4 1 tells me that if I'm a Christian I am living for God that I have a ministry my ministry is to show other people and tell other people about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. I am willing to talk with anybody about anything. If you got things in your life that you say, God will never forgive me and love me, please let me know. I'd like to talk to you about it. If there's anyone out there that thinks they might want to try this Christian walk, please get up with me. I will give you my um, email address. It's all small letters. It's A A D O. B B E R at yahoo.com. Like I said, it's a privilege and a pleasure for me to be here. I appreciate Miss Lynn having me. And I hope that something I have said today will be a turning point in your life. Thank you, Miss Lynn. Amen. Thank you, Deborah.
I'm just so thankful that, you know, he's the God of, we say it a lot, of the God of second chances. And, you know, just take a few moments. And, and I just want us to pray for this audience this morning because I feel like there's people listening today that they think that they've, they've just gone too far. They've just done too much. And, and that God just won't forgive them and he just won't love them. But if we just knew his love, you say, you know, it's easy for you because you're you're saved and, and you got it all together. People don't know what you go through. They don't no, know the battle that goes on in your in your mind or in your body or in your uh, life. But you know, life is real and we all face things. But I want us to pray this morning before we go off the air. So, Father, we just come to you this morning, Lord, and we thank you, Father God, that that you give us this opportunity to come to you to know you, to, to, to feel you, to experience you, God. And Lord, that's what our prayer is this morning, Lord, is that the listeners today will experience you, will experience that new birth, will experience that being born anew, and will experience as you help them walk out this journey, Lord, as we go about our daily walk. Father, it's like Deborah pre preached. Father, it's, it's not a, a life that makes us perfect because we are flawed vessels but but lord you are not flawed you are perfect and you can help an imperfect person lord as we serve a perfect god so we just pray this morning that the words that she has spoken will go out over these airwaves penetrate the heart penetrate the listener's heart god and draw them to you lord as we bid them to come to jesus to come to Jesus and to lay these burdens down at the foot of the cross yes, Lord. and to allow you to be the Lord and Savior of their life, Father. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, right now, we just want to lead them in a sinner's prayer. If you want to pray this prayer with us today, please feel free to. And just say, Dear Lord Jesus, we just ask that you would forgive us, wash us clean of all unrighteousness, all that's in us and has attached itself to us, all that we have done, said, thought, or every action, Lord, that we have acted out on, we ask for forgiveness. And we ask you to come and to cleanse us with your precious blood, Lord. Cleanse us and make us whole. Come into our heart and let us be yours. And we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And if you've prayed that prayer, and you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, we would love to hear from you. You can contact Deborah at the email address she gave a moment ago, or you can contact me at Ministries at AOL.com. Visit us on Facebook at Defining Moments Ministries, Inc. And let us know what God has done in your life today. And with everything else you've heard us say here, remember this. When you realize just how much Jesus Christ loves you and you surrender your life to him, then you will experience your greatest defining moment.